Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Hello everyone, welcome to this month's bonus video. I'm George the Antique Nomad. I have been putting aside some interesting things, 20 of them as a matter of fact, so that I can list them on eBay for you and you can watch them if you're a level two member or three member, you can watch them go live. Otherwise, you'll be seeing this a little bit after the original broadcast, but if these items are still available on eBay, you can go right to the listings. They are posted in the description below. You can see how these items are doing or have done at auction. This is a great way for us to experiment and find out more about what the current market on eBay is for these items in an auction scenario. I have put together a bunch of things I think are really fun and I can't wait to show you. But first, I do want to thank my level two and level three members whose contributions make this bonus video possible. And that's the reason that they get early access. So thank you so much for that. Now let's get started because I've got some neat stuff. Starting with, well, it's the last day of July and we're going to have Christmas in July. I don't usually sell my Christmas stuff ahead of time, but this guy came along and he's too cool to wait months to sell. So here he is. He is the Pepsi Cola Santa. We typically think of Coca-Cola as being synonymous with Santa because in 1931, they started the popularization and advertising of Santa Claus as a large fellow in a red suit. They were not the first ones to put Santa Claus in advertising, nor the first to put him in a red suit, but they were the ones that really cemented our image of this being Santa. Before that, Santa was depicted in various robes of different colors. He was depicted as being nice or mean. He was depicted as being thin or fat. Coca-Cola really cemented in the eyes of the Western world the notion that Santa Claus is a big, fat, jolly guy in a red suit. And this was actually based on a drawing of a department store Santa having a break and drinking a Coca-Cola. So that's where it came from. Well, Pepsi-Cola was not going to just let Christmas go by and let Coke have all the sales. Pepsi took a long time to really get successful. They actually went bankrupt right before the depression started and had to figure out a whole new way of getting their product out there. And they came up with the idea of making a larger bottle for the same price. So there was a slogan, uh, Pepsi Cola hits the spot 10 big ounces. That's a lot because they were offering you more product than the other soda companies. And so Pepsi became the discount brand and became very popular because of that and eventually made its way to its number two position in the soda market. This would have been done sometime after 1955 because it has a single dot in the bottle cap. The bottle cap logo had a double dot until 1955 and then from 1955 to 72 it had a single dot. So this is likely to date to the late 1950s. It is a store display, so it has its original easel on the back, which is in great condition. So you can set this guy up just like he would have been in a store. You see the information down by the packages here that he is litho in USA. So this was a point of purchase display for a store to get people to pick up cartons of Pepsi for the holidays. The colors are really great. The graphics are really good. Pepsi obviously is succumb to the coca-cola notion of what santa looks like so we're all in step there this one's in really good shape it's got a few little marks on it from having been stored for many years but overall it doesn't have a lot of bumps it's not creased it's not stained it's not folded it's not torn so uh, that's a good thing based on that these these don't come up all that often and even though it's cardboard rather than metal advertising cardboard advertising is starting to do well because metal advertising and enamel signs have gotten so expensive and so this guy i think we're starting him at 59 i suspect that he'll sell somewhere in the 75 to 95 dollar range 
Our next item is a famous advertising image as well, and this is the Fairbanks Gold Dust Twins. This is an original box of the washing powder with the Fairbanks Gold Dust Twins prominently on the logo. And this one has never been opened. This looks like it's about a one pound size. And you can see the Gold Dust Twins, let the twins do your work specifically was the motto. This was invented by the Fairbanks Soap Company of New York in 1892 and they show Goldie and Dusty, the two twins, doing all sorts of different housework and making your life so much easier in the process. The graphics are really strong. This box is in good condition. It doesn't have a lot of stains. It's got very little wear and the wear that's on it is normal. The Gold Dust Twins were very popular in their time. In fact, by 1903, less than 10 years after they were introduced, Gold Dust was the number one washing powder in the United States. It was one of the first major national brands, as a matter of fact. And Gold Dust Twins became a sobriquet for two people working closely together. You heard it referred to in baseball with various uh, pitchers and catchers who would work together, for example. And so this really had a huge impact on society in its way. The advertising icons went on for about 65 years and by the 1950s with the advent of civil rights this suddenly was seen as being not really a politically correct image anymore and so they were phased out at that time but the collectability of gold dust twins has remained very very strong bessie smith the very famous blues musician even refers to the gold dust twins on her 1928 song washerwoman's blues so it really was a big part of American culture in the first half of the 20th century, and there are a lot of collectors. We are starting this at $49. These typically sell for about 65 to 85 in this condition. So we'll see where this one goes. I crown the King George. This is a Habsburg crown, and it is actually the lid for a Fostoria crown piece. They came in various pieces, mostly candy compotes, although, and pedestal dishes, although there were candles and some other varieties. There were four basic crowns in the Fostoria crown line, and these were designed by George Secure, who was their very famous designer in the Art Deco era. I'm gonna step off screen so that you can see the piece a little better here. It's a very pretty cobalt blue, but it seems almost black in this light. It is not. This is the Habsburg crown you see here, which is probably the fanciest of the four. You got clear ruby, amber, and this uh, very pretty deep cobalt blue. The molds were later used by Indiana Glass, which made a green color that is very pretty. And Fenton did some varieties using these molds of small open dishes around 2000. So there have been other creations made using this because it was such a good design. Fostoria was a more traditional glass company, but they'd come out with the heirloom line in the mid-1950s as their peon to modernism. These crown lines were a way to give a modernist effect to something that was very old and traditional. And that was the inspiration that Secure used to create these lines. And they were very popular as specialty pieces and items that just seemed a little bit more regal and a little bit finer quality. Fostoria was always considered to be a good quality maker. And they used fire polishing so that you didn't see obvious seam lines. If you notice on here, this is a molded piece. So you would expect to see a seam line. And there are, in fact, seam lines there, but none of them are thick and heavy. Let me show you up close. None of them are thick and heavy and really impede with the design at all because Fostoria was very careful to not let that happen. When you hold this up to the light from my side, this is an amazing deep blue color. By the 60s, glass making in America, if you were buying from a higher quality brand like a Blanco or a Fenton or a Fostoria, you were getting a really nice heavy piece of glass that was very well made without bubbles, without impurities, and so they could do these very elaborate designs and have them turn out perfectly every time. I'm going to be starting this one at $49, and we will just see what the market thinks of it from there. I have seen a bunch of these sold recently missing lids in this color. 
I have not seen any in this color that actually got to completed sales that were complete. So I'll be curious to see how this does. This next item has an illustrious and unfortunately slightly checkered past as it turns out. This is a signed playbill from Beginner's Luck starring Bob Crane with the signature up in the corner there. This was done when he was performing at the Cirque Dinner Theater in Seattle, Washington. Bob Crane was a very successful drummer as a teenager and formed a bunch of bands around the area in Connecticut where he lived and was discovered by a local radio station. And they hired him ultimately to come and be a broadcaster. He ended up being discovered by CBS's flagship station in Los Angeles and ended up being the radio announcer for their very popular morning show in the mid-1950s. Once he got to LA, he started trying out for various roles, got some small parts in various movies, and even substituted for Johnny Carson on Johnny Carson's earlier pre-Tonight Show show as a guest host. So he got noticed in Hollywood, and he particularly did well with the Donna Reed show, and those folks referred him to someone who was casting for a new show called Hogan's Heroes, a very unlikely TV show about a suave and smart American soldier captured behind enemy lines in Germany, and he and his group of fellow conscriptees managed to do all sorts of stuff to support the resistance and thwart the Germans who were portrayed as being very hapless. Uh, it was interesting to me that only 20 years after World War II that such a show could exist in the first place and that it was a big hit. It went on until 1971 and he became very famous for it. Unfortunately for him, so famous that he began to become typecast and had trouble getting other roles. And so he decided that he would buy the right to beginner's luck and that he would take it to dinner theaters around the country in order to keep his name out there, to keep touring. He ended up with quite a circuit. He went from the Showboat Theater in St. Petersburg, Florida, to the Cirque in Seattle, and a lot of places in between, including a dinner theater in Scottsdale, Arizona, which was where he was performing during the period of time that he reached his unfortunate end. He got involved with a man that Richard Dawson introduced him to by the name of John Carpenter, who worked for Sony, and John Carpenter knew all about video recording equipment. And while Bob Crane had a little peccadillo, he liked to take pictures in flagrante, and sometimes without the assent of their husbands, boyfriends, and other people. He ended up murdered in his apartment. Scottsdale was a small place at that time. They didn't even have a homicide division. They certainly were not equipped for proper forensic detailing of the crime scene, especially involving a celebrity with a lot of media hype and attention being given to it. There were charges laid against John Carpenter. It, they were not able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it had anything to do with him. And unfortunately, Bob Crane had left a lot of angry husbands and boyfriends in the wake. So they never were able to prove who did it. And because of that, his very spotless reputation was certainly sullied in his death. This one is starting at $9.99. It's just a basic four panel piece. But because of its illustrious signature, I have a feeling that it will do better than that. And I'll be curious to see how this does out on eBay. The next items I have to show you are rather special. This is a man and woman couple. These are buckskin dolls made by Native Americans, and we have a good attribution for these because of this nice tag that is left on with this one that says, This couple were made by an Indian tribe in Thai Valley, Oregon. Well, that would be part of the Columbia River tribes, and Thai Valley, Oregon is in Wasco County. This is near Salilo Falls. Salilo Falls was a huge fishing and gathering spot for the Native Americans of the Columbia River until the Bonneville Power Administration flooded it behind a dam 
in the 1930s, and that really changed the culture dramatically. These would have been made before that time. These likely date to about 1910, 1910, 1920. You can see that they're made with real buckskin that's been tanned. It appears to be real human hair that is red. We have these tin decorations on them and the beading as well. You can tell a lot of detail went into these. These are a little bit better than typical of their era. You can see this fabric here, which is very typical of 19 teens, 20s calico fabric. And so everything about these seems to be absolutely right for their date. They came from a good collection out of Spokane, thinking that they were from that part of the region, but they actually are a little farther south. We'll show you the other one here. It's got great detail. Now these prices for these are all over the board and detail really does matter. So hopefully the way that I've shown these, you will get the good detail in the photos on eBay because this will make a difference in how and whether they sell. I've seen prices as low as 125 each and as high as 250 each. I've seen others where people were asking several hundred to a thousand dollars. It's kind of all over the place. So I am likely to put a reserve on these. I have sold a set before. I think we got 250 for that set. So I'm excited to have these again. I think these are better than the ones that I had previously. And we will see what the market thinks of them. But I think they're just wonderful. Next is another really beautiful piece of glass. And that is this. This is designed to look like a coolie. You see the hat. You see the braid down the back. And you see the way that the arms are interlinked in a circle and this fold at the bottom. There were several companies in Italy in, on the island of Murano who made these types of figures, but the one that seems to connect with all of these design features is Formia Murano, and the only pieces that I've seen signed, this one is not, were signed S. Puccini. Not to be confused with the Puccini of opera fame, there's actually been some confusion about that online. No, this is S. Puccini who worked for Formia Murano, and that is the only attribution I've been able to find with another one of these figures, and it was the same exact pose, but in a silver color. I've had this in orange before. You see it in clear. I don't run into green very often at all. And while it's a specifically ethnic style, what's interesting to me about this piece is that they chose this form because it was so geometric and so modern, even though it represents an ethnic design that is really no longer what we associate with China, it was definitely seen as something that translated well to modernism. And I think it really does. The colors are really great. They're very strong. It's very deep. I just think the whole thing is delightful. Uh, the peak is in really good shape. You have to be very careful with these extremities with Murano glass. It is possible for little chips uh, to have happened without really being noticed. So you have to check this over carefully. And I've said this before, but to do that, use the palm of your hand, not your fingertips, because your fingertips get calloused. But if you use the palm of your hand, you'll notice anything that feels out of the ordinary. And fortunately, this one is in great shape. So I'm happy to present this. This is, like I said, several Murano companies did this form, but this one we attribute to Puccini for this exact design and those characteristics I mentioned. I think the value of this could be as high as $100, but we're going to start it at half that. So somebody might get a real bargain, but we're going to give it a shot and see what the market looks like for this today. This next piece is also similarly very angular and very wild in a mid-century design way, and that is because it is a hull butterfly vase, or perhaps a cornucopia, because it's shaped like a cornucopia, sort of. It's also shaped like a vase, sort of. And that was the idea with 50s design, is that we're going to modernize design, make things flowing, get rid of straight edges, and in the process, we're going to create new forms that maybe bridge a gap between a couple of different styles. And certainly that is what Louise Bauer did when she designed this line of butterfly for hull. Hull pottery is 
better known by a lot of people for pastel floral vases from the 1940s and early 50s before their factory flooded and exploded in July of 1950. When it was rebuilt, which took over a year, it couldn't do those glazes anymore, and so Hull had to come up with new lines. This one says copyright 1956. That is the year that Louise Bauer created this for Hull. She had done a lot of work for them. She had won an award the previous year for the ebb tide line with all those great crazy fish that swim around the bottoms of vases and uh, appear as uh, candlesticks and all sorts of neat things. And so this was kind of continuing on that same line. I really like the butterflies. I like the fact that you've got something white with a little bit of pastel. Again, I am looking for things that I think will come into style with new people because people are starting to decorate with a lot of gray tones. White accents look good against gray. Pastel colors look good against gray. So I think that this has real potential to come back as a good collectible in the marketplace. There was a time in the 1980s and 90s that these were pretty sought after. The prices have come down over the last 20 years as taste changed and collecting taste changed. But I think it's very timely for this to make a comeback. And so I am only starting it at $29, but I believe that the value today should be about $45. There was a time where this would have sold for $75 to $95. And I think that time may return because these pieces are so ultra modern. And I think that the color tone is going to be timely with what's happening in the marketplace today. So I'm curious to see how the response to this is. I always thought it was a really fun design and we'll see who else agrees with me. There's a lot of interest in comic books these days, but this comic book is perhaps one of the most valuable that you will ever see, at least of its ilk, because this one is done by the Air Pirates. The Air Pirates took their name from a 1930s group of antagonists that Mickey Mouse used to have to face, but they were becoming his antagonists in the late 1960s and early 70s because they believed that Mickey Mouse was the epitome of corporate culture, of American mass consumption. They just saw Mickey Mouse as being representative of a whole lot of things that they did not think were helping society at the time. So they decided to lampoon Mickey Mouse by creating the Air Pirates Funnies. It was a group including Dan O'Neill, Gary Hallgren, Bobby London, whose name you see in the corner for the cover art here, and Ted Richards. O'Neill in particular was very, very much interested in using Mickey Mouse as the basis of his lampoon. And the reason for that was he felt that by forcing the issue, they could go to court, they could determine that Mickey Mouse had become generic, that Mickey Mouse was a cultural icon and not a copyrighted figure. And so they deliberately used Mickey's image. And in addition, they even sent copies of this to Disney. Disney came at them hard. And it was ultimately decided after appeal all the way up to the Ninth Circuit that indeed Air Pirates was using a copyrighted image, that they did not have the rights to this, that Disney did have the right to take the final 10,000 printings out of circulation and destroy them, which Disney did. So these are hard to find because of that. These are a really scarce counterculture comic, and especially in this condition. This one is nearly flawless. There's a lot of things. I'm not going to let the camera pan too long because a lot of these are drug-related or sexual in nature, and that's the reason that it says up here, Nick's kids, adults only. <laughs> And it's definitely adult-only entertainment, but it is actually very collectible now. Countercultural comics and publications are very much in demand. And this one is going to likely sell somewhere over $200. So we're going to put it on eBay and see if that customer who understands and collects these things is out there. Because there's not a ton of them around. There's very few in good shape. And this one in particular because of its history, is a big deal to the countercultural collectors. Our next two offerings are, surprisingly enough, the same book. 
but different editions. And I am curious to see this as an experiment to see whether condition or scarcity will create a higher price. Let me show you what I mean. First of all, let's talk about the book. It is Speedy of Oz. We'll show the one that's in better shape as we talk about it. Speedy and Oz, if you notice all the umbrellas, Speedy was a character from a previous Oz book, and he ends up shooting up on a geyser up into the sky and lands on Umbrella Island, one of a bunch of floating islands above Oz. This was written by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Uh, L. Frank Baum, the originator of the Oz books, had died many years before, and she picked up the mantle and continued to write. This one is actually dedicated to her daughter inside. The thing that's uh, so interesting to me about this is it was one of 40 Oz-related books that were written. Oz books were so popular that lots of people wanted to collect every single one in the series, but a lot of them came out during the Depression, including this one, which came out in 1934. In that year, when this one came out, this is the original, and this is the first printing of the first edition. The first printing of the first edition had color plates wonderful color plates. They really add a lot to the book. The first editions had those. The Oz books were so popular they continued to reissue them and after the Second World War you would have had this version, the one that's in better condition, and it on the same page just has a black and white drawing of Speedy climbing up. So that is one big difference between the two pressings and you have to look for things like certain codes or the title page to be able to tell one from another. Again, here we have a color plate right across from the title page in the original, whereas in the reprint, we have a blank page across from the title page. So that's why the first editions are more sought after, not just because they were the first, but because they had a little different illustration. Jonathan Arneal was the illustrator of the Oz books. And so people want the color plates if they can get them. So in that regard, this one should be the more valuable because it is the first printing of the first state. However, condition on this is not terrific. There's some blemishes on the cover that you can see, including, unfortunately, where a previous bookseller put this. And this is a warning. Please don't put post-its on paper that has color because right there is where they had it and now there is a nice little tear on his leg that didn't exist before because it's stuck to the back of the post-it. Just because post-its come off of paper fairly easily doesn't mean they should be put without thought onto items that have color printing. It's just not a good idea. This also has some problems in that it has foxing and staining and the spine is cracked. You can see the cracking of the spine. You can see the staining from age. Uh, you can see foxing on the first color print here. That's these spots that get into books and it really is a form of mold. It's not that it really hurts the book, but you can't get the spots out without fumigating and that's a very expensive a process. The thing is, is that this book in this condition, being a first edition, may not sell more for this later edition in really good condition that has a nice dust jacket, doesn't have any cracking along the spine. And so I'm curious to see which one will do better or if they'll both do about the same. And that's the reason I'm going to put both of them on eBay now so that we can see how one does versus the other. I think it'll be an interesting test to see what is more important to the collectors? Is it scarcity or is it condition? Because both of those things affect value. And a lot of people who are bibliophiles may be more interested in the scarcity and the story behind it. But a lot of people who like these for display may want the one that has the really great bright cover. So we will see what the market tells us about this. I suspect both of these should sell in the 35 to $50 range. This little ashtray tells an interesting story. In fact, it tells an interesting story about a company. It also tells a little story about the person who used it. So we're going to get into that in a little bit here. But let's first talk about the company. So this is a centennial advertising ashtray, 1856 to 1956, 100 years quality and service. 
and it says on the side that it is from the Robinson Clay Products Company. Well, Robinson may be familiar to you if you know our RP company, Roseville, Ohio. So wait a second. Robinson Ramsbot and Pottery Company in Roseville, Ohio. Robinson Clay Product Company of Akron, Ohio. Could there be a connection? Why, yes, there is. In 1920, those two firms merged. Companies started out usually making sanitary tile, clay tile, bricks, things like that. And then if they got into housewares and artware and glazed items, it was usually later as an expansion of the business. Well, in this case, Robinson had been in business since the 1850s, making the basics that people needed to pave cities and build sewers and all that kind of thing. And then Ramsbot and Pottery in Roseville, Ohio, not to be mistaken with the Roseville Pottery, which is the floral Roseville we think of, not the same company. So Ramsbottom and Rose and Robinson merged in 1920 because they had complementary businesses. I told you it said a story about the person who owned this too. Look at this ashtray and look where there's a little bit of effect to the glaze from a cigarette having been left there a whole lot. And what side it is on the left side. So this was actually owned by a left-hander, which means a one in 10 shot because 90% of the people are right-handed and they would have put the cigarette on the other side. It's interesting for anyone who's a Robinson Ramsbottom collector, but also for advertising collectors and just pottery wonks in general, because it speaks to a certain time, it speaks to a certain history for a certain company. And that's the reason these sorts of things are collectible. I imagine that this will probably sell in the 30 to $40 range but we will find out now because we're going to list it. I was able to stop briefly in Colorado Springs and go shopping with Yvonne Thrifty Rich. And then we met uh, David of Junk Drunk Mantiques and Sarah of Traveling Button. And Sarah was the one who pointed this out in an antique mall and showed it to me. And I have to say, I was not familiar with these and she was kind enough to let me buy it so that I could present it to all of you. This is a turned wood sculpture. I've been thinking for a long time that turned wood, which I saw done a lot in the 1990s, should be more desirable in the marketplace, but that the problem was we don't have very good scholarship or information and a lot of these pieces aren't even signed. Well, Sarah turned me on to this because it is signed and she said people are starting to become aware of this artist and she was kind enough to give me a chance to share this with you. And she is correct in that. Here it is signed Ted Johnson II, so Ted Johnson II, 1994. This is made of maple. And I really like the painting with the Picasso S figures. I'm gonna leave the screen so that you can see just the face a little bit better focus on its face and not mine. It looks like two figures nose to nose having a kiss. Ted Johnson is one of the first that I have seen as far as a wood sculptor and wood turner who seems to be known in the marketplace and is starting to be collected. Now when I say that Ted Johnson is known in the marketplace, now, when I say that Ted Johnson is known in the marketplace, what I mean is that we are starting to see his pieces listed on some pretty high-end websites like Cherish and First Dibs. We're seeing actual sales on eBay. We're still not seeing a lot of scholarship on who Ted Johnson was. The only information I've been able to find is it appears that he was American, that he was very prolific in the mid-1990s, that his pieces tend to be signed and dated, and that he won an award in Australia, the uh, Forestry SA Wood Sculpture Award. And they exhibited him at when he was contemporary in Australia. So apparently he was considered to be a good artist. He's an award-winning artist. I wish we knew more about him. If someone out there does know more about Ted Johnson, I would really like to share that with everybody. So part of the reason I'm putting this out there is because now that I've been made aware of it, I'd like to see if we can't find more information about this up and coming collectible. The other reason that I'm putting that out there is because I think this thing's really cool. 
And because I think it's really cool and it's very artistic and very studied, it's not trying to be a vessel or a houseware. It is literally a sculpture. I mean, it's got a little tiny hole in the top. I suppose you could put a flower in it. I don't think that's really the point. I think the point was for it to be a palette for him to do his artwork. And that's what makes it significant. So as an art line, I think this is an up and comer, definitely something to watch for. And if you have more information about this, let us know. In the meantime, we're going to try to add to the pricing information by putting this on eBay and letting it go at auction and see what it sells for. We are going to start this out at only $29. Now I've seen asking prices as high as the hundreds. The reason I'm starting it at a low price is because I didn't pay a whole lot for it and because I'm really curious to see how this artist does. And so I really want to start it at a price where I think there'll be some bidding and perhaps someone will come out of the woodwork and know more about this person. This next piece is kind of big. So we're going to have to show you in little pieces at a time, I think. But this is a really sweet embroidery and I'm going to show you the bottom corner first because that tells the story of how this came to be. If you see the initials there that say L-O-S-N-A, that stands for Ladies of Shrine North America. So this is the women's group for the Shriners. And this one is signed in fabric, Waheed Court number 81, Anchorage, Alaska. I think this thing is just darling. If you take a look at the way that this is made, it's very thin, so it's a summer weight. You can see that from the edge here. It's got nice broad bands, which is more typical of 1940s, 50s embroidery when fabric is a little less dear. It's not the depression, so we're not doing thin bands anymore. This would have been something that was done, and I'm gonna start holding it up so you can see the various panels because they're really darling and they depict a lot of children in parkas. So this was something that was done as a donation, perhaps to the Shriners Hospital. A lot of the things that the women do in the auxiliaries is to make things like this to give to children who are at the Shriners Children's Hospitals or to give to families in need and that sort of thing. But whoever got this one really loved it and did not want to use it. So it has no stains, no holes, no damage, no fading, no bleaching. And I just think it's really fun, the various things it depicts these kids doing. I hope you're able to see all of this because I can't really see the screen. So I'm just going to do my best to take this a little at a time and try to show you. It has a total of 20 embroidered panels of kids and it measures a about five and a half feet at its longest point. Let me flip this over this way so we can show you some more. And you've got sledding and you've got sewing and you've got playing with the dog, ice fishing. There are any number of scenes that have to do with kids having fun. And I think that was the idea is you may be in Alaska, but it's not too cold to button up and go outside and do something that you enjoy. I just think this is a really neat thing. I'm going to see if I can get back a little farther and show you a wider opening of it so that you get the idea. We can show about six panels at a time this way. You're just going to have to imagine this as one large completed finished blanket. It's very sweet. I think it's a very specific thing. I figure this is the time of year that a lot of people from Alaska start touring the rest of the country because they can get out and a lot of people from the rest of the country start going to Alaska for cruises and to see the Northern Lights. So I thought the timing would be interesting with all that. I am going to start this piece at $45 and we will see what the market thinks of that. But I think it's just really cool and I'll bet someone else does too. Well, it's interesting that our other countercultural piece had to do with someone who is itching for a fight and trying to have a lawsuit brought against them for copyright infringement. Because this countercultural piece, which I will turn on its side in a moment so you can see, says, Just passing through, keep on trucking 75. 
and you see these fellows in these exaggerated bell bottoms and shoes who are trucking on through in a very stylish gait. This was a classic 1970s counterculture design by R. Crumb. Robert Crumb is an artist who became very associated with the counterculture. He was involved with the creation of Zap Comics in 1967, which was the first successful countercultural comic book. I actually have a Zap comic that will be available for sale as well. This guy ended up creating this set of images. We'll show you again because they were quite iconic in the 1970s. And he created this set of images using his pen and ink style of drawing with a lot of very close cross hatching and cross hairs, so there's a lot of detail. He created this, it immediately started to be ripped off by other people. And his lawyers, after a few years had had it, they had made an arrangement with AA Sales, who was one of the companies that was using the image without licensing. The company gave some royalties for what it had already done and then continued to use it without permission and made more money and didn't pay any more royalties. So it ended up being another lawsuit. And he has continued to have to fend off unauthorized use of this. And the whole reason is when he did Zap Comics and introduced these characters in 1967, the point of which, by the way, was to show some sort of a strut or a stride that the countercultural people, hey, we're going to walk on li through life and we're going to hit our stride and we're going to have fun and we're just going to keep on going. And that was the idea behind this. Well, everybody from this AA sales to Amazon has tried to rip off this image and sell it without paying license fees because when he did the first Zap comics, he had a copyright on the whole comic book but the page that this was on did not specifically have a copyright mark. So it went back and forth between a couple of courts saying, well, yes, he did intend to copyright it. And well, no, he didn't because he didn't put a copyright on the actual page with the cartoon. He ended up suing in the same court that had found the Air Pirates funnies guilty of stealing a corporate image in that manner. But he lost. So he had to appeal again and he finally got a court to understand that yes, of course, he did intend to copyright it from the beginning, which turned out to be really important because this is the thing he is the most known for of everything that he ever did. Um, he is still working to this day, and there are still images officially from him that are being used with these characters to this day. So it is a countercultural icon. These sell for about $30 typically, and we're going to put this on and see what the response is. But Arkham was definitely a big deal in the countercultural world. He came up with characters like Fritz the Cat. I remember being six years old and being very disappointed because my parents would not take me to see Fritz the Cat. And I said, but it's a cartoon. And they said, it's an adult cartoon. And I did not understand what that meant. Well, I saw it when I was an adult. Now I understand what that meant. For my next offering, I wanted to put something up that wasn't going to necessarily be expensive, but was a beautiful example of its type. And I chose this Japanese luster mustard pot. Now, when we call it Japanese luster, that is because on the bottom we have, in this case, we have a pretty nice logo with the maker's name very clear on it, made in Japan in the 1930s. The heyday of this luster ware in Japan was 1934 to 1936 only, and while they made quite a lot of it in a short period of time, by 1937 we were on the outs with Japan because of their invasion of Manchuria, and we were ceasing doing business with them. So they had a very brief period of time to sell these items. The Depression was just recovering, so they knew they had to keep things inexpensive, but they wanted to give it a lot of design, so they used the blue and the gold luster together. And this is a mustard pot. It could be used for other sauces, but this was thought of as a mustard pot because it has the small spoon. A mayonnaise pot would have had a larger ladle inside of it. And then it has the liner as well as the lid, so it's a four-piece set. The painting is all done by hand, and I like that big blue flower in the middle of it. 
Mustard pots were something that didn't appear on tables until the Georgian era because mustard was always served dry until then. And at a certain point, they figured out how to make the mustard into balls that they could send and distribute around England. And then you had to moisten it with something, maybe wine, maybe water, and you needed a place to put it. So mustard pots come on the scene at that time. So this is about 100 some years after, 140, 150 years after the original mustard pots, which were made of very expensive Georgian silver. And this would have been something that would have been in a nice middle class home made of porcelain. This is porcelain. Someone asked me recently, what's the difference between porcelain and pottery? Uh, the porcelain is fired at a higher temperature. It uses generally bone as part of the mix. That's why you call it bone china. And it is a very thin, very hard, harder to break form than earthenware. If you were to chip this, it would chip in little shell-shaped chips along the edge, not a chunk like pottery does. So those are some clues to porcelain. This is a very sweet little piece, and I expect that it will sell somewhere in the $25 to $30 range. We're going to start it at $19 and just let it be a fun thing for somebody's table. But I wanted to share the information about lusterware to let you know the time frame because it's a much narrower time frame than people realize that it was popular and tell you a little bit about it. This guy is just so cool looking. I think it's such a great design and I wanted to share this with you. I bought two of these together. One of them sold right away at the very next show I did and this one I still have in my inventory so I've decided to put it out on eBay. It is by Shawnee Pottery and it does not look like what a lot of people think of Shawnee but I'll show you here. This is their later logo, the Shawnee with the line over the word Shawnee, you can see there. And that logo is typically associated with items that they made in the mid 50s until their final production in 1961. Up until the mid 50s, Shawnee was known for whimsical, happy pottery. They had bought the old American encaustic tile plant in Zanesville Ohio during the Depression, started making their wear there, and they did Smiley Pig and Winnie Pig and the Owl and lots of happy cookie jars, and everybody was a character and hand-painted. Well, that was really great during the 1930s and 40s when people were looking for happiness and escapism from the Depression and the Second World War. But by the 50s, people were looking for modern, and Shawnee started to see the sales of the whimsical lines decrease. And a lot of other people got into cookie jars and started doing the types of things they were doing. So they were looking for something to do that would be completely different, and they radically changed their lines and went all modern. They had a designer who had come to them right at the end of the Second World War by the name of Robert Hedeman, and he made huge changes in their post-war lines. During the Second World War, they'd made a lot of earthenware and dishware and things for the U.S. Army, and then that contract was over, and they saw that the market was changing, so he started working on more modern lines. This would have come out about 1950, so it has all sorts of art deco elements, and yet at the same time, it's also starting to cross into art modern and modernism. I just think it's such a neat design. It's abstract in the eyes and yet very literal in the horns and the mane. So you really get, and the detail in the flowers, so you really get a lot of design with this. Here's the other side where you've got the gazelles together, the mother and child. I just think it's a beauty, and especially in this really beautiful, very soft, satiny, matte black glaze. It's matte or maybe a semi-gloss, but it's not a, uh, it's not a shiny black, you can see. It's not a super reflective glaze. It's more, of a, it's more to the matte glaze. I just think this thing is really handsome, and the person who got the other one was thrilled, and I think they paid around $75. I believe that's what this could sell for. We're going to put it up on eBay now and find out. Also very 1950s where pottery is concerned is this piece. This one heralds from a line of birds that was made by William Maddox in his California pottery. He started in 1937 
at the depths of the depression making bird figures primarily and is very well known for them. Now his early pieces say William or W.M. Maddox, but this one says Maddox of California and that lets us know that this piece was made after 1949 when he sold the company and for about another 25 years they made various wear including a ton of really cool TV lamps. The Swan is one we see a lot, but this Double Flamingo, we believe, was one of the lines that William Maddox designed originally. I'm pretty sure I've seen it with a William Maddox line, uh, line mark as well. So I believe this one actually came out in the late 40s, but of course by the 50s, flamingos were all the rage. And this was part of the reason he was able to sell the company is because items like this were selling really well. This is a Double Flamingo planter. I've always liked this piece. I have one in my own collection. And I just think that the shape and the design and the colors are really good. The other thing I really like about this piece is the condition. The condition is really clean on this one. There's no chips, there's no damage of any sort. These were lightweight enough because by this time they're competing with Japanese companies. So now shipping costs are starting to be an issue because They've got to be able to get this across the country and compete with things coming over from Japan that cost 19 cents wholesale. So uh, they really did a good job making this something that was very fashion forward at its time. And flamingos, of course, because so many people started to move to Florida in the post-war era, partly because a lot had been stationed there or recuperated there, and partly because air conditioning and auto travel became more widespread. So suddenly Florida was a more viable place to live and tour and a whole lot of people started doing it. I think this is a really pretty piece. I've always been a big fan. It is functional as a vase. I've never seen anyone actually use one. They generally just want it as sculpture. This one is starting at only $29, but the prices have gone up on these and there's a good chance that this could sell for at least 55 to 65. The next piece I have to show you, unfortunately, I can't take it out of its box because it's never been out of its box and I don't want to be the one to open it. But you can see what it is because it is shown very clearly right on the box. This is a Space Needle pen, new old stock in the original box from the Seattle World's Fair. This is the 60th anniversary of the Seattle World's Fair and the opening of the Space Needle was 60 years ago this year. So there's nothing more appropriate. These were done in a box that you could actually mail. On the side, it had various attractions in the state of Washington to get you to go around. And on the other side, it says all sorts of things about what's happening at the Seattle World's Fair. So this is a, if you were gonna have one single item from the Seattle World's Fair, this is great because it shows so many examples of the other attractions there. And it talks about the fair itself, the world of science, the world of Century 21, which was their look into the future. A lot of things that they predicted, like being able to go on a telephone and see the person on the other end came true. The world of art, the world of entertainment, boulevards of the world. That's where a lot of Danish modern furniture was introduced to the American market for the first time. And the monorail, which still runs in Seattle. But of course, the Space Needle was the big crowning achievement and the thing that Seattle and the World's Fair are probably the most synonymous with. Uh, the pens are really cool. Why is it new in the box? Well, there was a big overrun of these and they did not all get distributed in time for the fair. So you will see them new in box from time to time. I am starting this at $9.99, no reserve, but they typically sell for about $30. So I'm curious to see, I know some of the people on eBay have taken them out of the box to show the pen. It's made out of a blonde wood. It looks almost exactly like this. I don't know whether me not taking out of the box will hurt or help the sale. I want mine to be the one that was unsealed, uh, that was sealed and unbroken. So we're gonna see if that makes a difference or not. One more cool thing from the 50s that I found recently and want to put out to share is this. This is by Elgin American, and look at the golfers with the enameling and the paint and the neat way that the tree and the grounds are etched. When I lean it forward a little bit so you have less glare right on it, you really see the full scene. A lot of detail on this. 
If it looks a lot like a compact or a cigarette case, well, that's no surprise because the maker of this, as you see on the inside where it's got the turnings up on the clasp here is Elgin American. And you see this opens up. This would have been to hold money. It's probably too thin to have held cigarettes. So this was a money case with the turned interior. Turned metal interiors were a big thing in the mid to late 1950s. I had a Studebaker that had a turned metal dashboard. That was a thing in the mid 50s. And so that gives us a good idea of the date of these. It's very sweet. It has its original little card that says, happy birthday to you. With love from mother. Isn't that nice? So mom gave her son a nice little case to keep his dollar bills in. It's in really good shape and it could be used as a money case today. There's nothing wrong with it. One thing I've been taught is push the button when you go to latch them so you're not putting extra wear on the latch. It's just a way to preserve it and make it last longer if you're going to use it. These are perfectly fine to use. They were made for that purpose. I think it's really neat. It's an example of when golfing really starts to take off as a leisure sport in the 1950s. It becomes the sport of aspiring junior salesmen and middle managers and that sort of thing because you can get out on the golf course and talk to the uppers in your company and socialize and hobnob and do deals while you're also playing the game. So golf is a big and rising sport in the 1950s and 60s and that's why this would have been an appropriate motif at the time. Starting this also at $29, I really think the value is probably closer to 50 or 60, especially in this condition. Elgin American is not related to the Elgin Watch Company. In fact, they had a big lawsuit over using the Elgin name, and that's why they added American to it so that there wouldn't be any mistaking the Elgin watches for this company that did make watch cases as well as these other accoutrements, compacts, that sort of thing. And that brings us to our last item of the day. And this one will be fun because it can't help but make you sound good. That was I Don't Know What I'm Doing by George. Thank you very much. I have played musical instruments. I have not been trained to play a harmonica correctly, but if I was going to, this would be a hard one to start with. This is a 64 chromonica by Honer. Honer is from Germany. They are the biggest makers of harmonicas and related instruments in the world and have been for a very long time. I see that I've smudged this a little bit with my hands, so we'll be doing a little polishing before we put it up on eBay to sell. But this is a very, very famous mouthpiece. And the reason that it's so famous is because it was the first mouthpiece, the harmonica, when it came out in 1938. It was the first that could play four different octaves at the same time. And it has the slide. And as you heard when I was attempting to play it there, the slide actually creates sharps and flats. So you really have the range of 64 notes and that was the point. It's almost as much range as a piano has which was also the point point. and you can see the way that it's made here. It's a very good instrument, a very precise instrument. I'm selling it for somebody who is a drummer in a band and thought he could learn how to play harmonica on the side and add to the band and then realized that this was a whole lot more harmonica to learn. This is for someone who is devoted to playing this instrument. And I think of people, well, Stevie Wonder uses one of these, for example. Or the fellow in The The, which was one of my favorite bands, if you remember them in the early 1990s. They had the song uh, Dogs of Lust that starts with a very long harmonica part. And he was a big harmonica player. So there have been a lot of famous bands to use these. It's a great instrument. Uh, the fact that it has the four octave range is the reason that it can get a lot of the low registers and a lot of the growl that you hear out of low register. And that's why it was significant. So it really did change music. It's been used by classical players, jazz players, rock players, and it's a great piece. 
So I was glad to put this out. It's a, I played saxophone, but I, this is a different woodwind for me. And so we're gonna send it on to someone who does know how to play it properly. I'm going to start it out at $59. They typically sell for over a hundred. So we will see how that does and we'll see how all these things do. I am so excited to bring you these items and to share them with you both here and on eBay so that you can learn along with me how auctions do, what items do better at auction, what maybe in retrospect we would sell a different way once we find out this is an experiment. We are trying to understand the market better and learn the ins and outs of eBay and how you sell different types of items in different manners on that platform. And so we really appreciate you going along with us for these journeys. I'm George the Antique Nomad. Please check me out on the social links and the media that you see in the description. And we will be back again next month with another bonus video. Thank you all you members who subscribe and give us a little bit of extra help to make these possible. And thank you to everybody out there watching. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below. Click the bell to be notified when new videos upload. Leave a comment below and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now.